Mr. Arnold? Mr. Arnold? John, I'm in. Great. Down. Ahead of you is a metal staircase. Go down it. Okay. Going down. After 20 or 30 feet, you come to a T-junction. Take a left. Just never follow the main cable, John. I understand how to read a schematic. Damn it. Dead end. World War II was largely miserable for just about everybody involved. Whether your home was destroyed, or you had to forcibly move, lost family members, or were just flat out killed, it wasn't really something you would enjoy being in or would want to return to. But for one group of people, it was a great and extremely unique time to hone their craft, tank designers. Where after the 20 year period of the interwar era, they could put their designs to the test and get feedback almost immediately on new ideas that were sent to the front. However, as tanks were a relatively new concept still, even arguably when they finally saw use in their second major conflict, a lot of ideas that looked great on paper or had worked better in the past did not pan out quite as well in reality. Here's some developmental dead ends that were produced in the interwar and world war II era. This is one that, with the power of hindsight, provokes many questions as to why it was a thing. As all modern tanks, and all of the really successful ones of the past, only have a single turret, and it's become one of the pillars of tank design. But in the late 20s and early 30s, when most of the following designs popped up, it came from what seemed like a relatively simple answer to a complex question. How do you give a tank more firepower and the ability to take on multiple and various kinds of targets? And this idea of just sticking a bunch of guns on something to fix the problem was not really a new one. If you look at pre-dreadnought ships, for example, hosts of guns were fitted to them before ship designers realized that the answer to this was a bit more complicated. And these gigantic land ships exemplify this concept through the eyes of tank designers, with just about every major power and even some minor ones experimenting with multi-turret designs. The British tinkered with ideas such as the medium Mark III and the A1E1 Independent. The Japanese experimented with the Type 95 and Type 91 heavies. The Soviets created quite a few, including the T-35, the T-100, and SMK, and even the Germans got involved with the Nuba Ferzug. Hope I'm saying that right. Out of all these designs listed, only the T-35 and that one saw any sort of extended combat, with some of the Soviet prototypes being tested on the front in the Winter War. And the results of their actions were not stellar. The new whatever project was cancelled in the 30s after five prototypes, but were used in the invasion of Norway, mostly for that good good propaganda footage, but they suffered from reliability problems and lack of armor protection compared to how big of a target the thing was, losing many crew members to anti-tank rifles. The T-35 has an even worse story, as it was rushed to the front with all available tanks in 1941 to slow the German invasion, but were lost in scores from reliability problems. Some sources say up to 90% from this and were abandoned by crews and blown up whenever possible to keep them from falling to the Germans. And these reasons, among a few others we'll get into in a second, are why all the other prototypes previously mentioned were cancelled before they could go into production and see any service. There's a whole host of problems that begin to appear once you start actually operating one of these multi-turret tanks. The first is just commanding the thing. A tank commander's job is already pretty busy with one turret and one gun. Adding on more is not going to increase your firepower, but in reality actually kind of diminish it, because the commander needs to spot targets for you and can only do this one at a time. So instead of a gigantic monster firing in all directions, you get a gigantic target that can't see anything and is probably firing less than other vehicles with just one gun. Which brings us to the second problem. These things were huge and very heavy, even for their time and often, because of their large size, had to keep armor relatively thin to keep weight down, as previously shown in the Nuba Fersafa. Combine this with the large size, and this is an anti-tank gun crew's wet dream. Reliability was also almost universally a problem. There were other attempts to fill the developmental spot that multi-turret tanks were trying to in a much more successful way, i.e. a range of firepower for multiple uses such as the Char B and M3 Lee having both turreted anti-tank and hull-mounted infantry support 75mm guns. But even these, to create the space for both armaments, were very large and very tall and ended up also being abandoned later. There are a couple other examples, such as a few versions of the Crusader that had a turret for the Hall machine gun, but this too was eventually scrapped. So although a valiant effort, and something probably worth a try before we knew what we know now, multi-turreted designs have taken their place in history as a very solid dead end.
It's a dead end. Hey, Bill, would you help me program my guns? Oh, wait, I have a cannon. Like the rest of the world. Why, you? <laughs> the idea for tankettes goes back to World War I, back when you assumed the gender of tanks, and vehicles with cannons were classified as male, and the ones with only machine guns were classified as female, hence the name tankette. And was also based on a fairly simple idea that just ran headlong into reality, being that machine gun kill a lot of people, but people kill machine gunner. Machine gunner have to hide behind things, but then he no reach people. So put machine gunner in bulletproof box that moves and go get people. And don't get me wrong, this concept did work in certain scenarios. Female tanks of World War I, before any anti-tank weapons really existed, get a good job of taking the fight to the enemy if properly supported. And in other conflicts, like the Spanish Civil War, tankettes could be extremely useful in fighting lightly armed infantry. Due to their smaller size, if given a powerful enough engine, they could be and were used for speedy reconnaissance. The problem, though, comes when you run into anything that is capable of destroying a tank. Or, if you're really unlucky, another tank armed with a cannon, because you simply can't compete anymore. Like multi-turrets, but to a larger degree, tankettes were experimented with by basically everyone, and there are a lot of models that you can look to. The most successful use would probably be the German tank force for most of the Blitzkrieg gears, relying heavily on the Panzer I, only mounting machine guns, and the Panzer II with the 20mm autocannon, that although better than just a machine gun, did have its shortcomings. But the Germans were able to take over most of Europe with this. But they achieved this by doing a very good job of pairing their Panzer 1s and 2s with heavier tanks such as the Panzer 3, 4, and 38T that had proper cannons on them so that the shortcomings were reduced, bringing up the heavier vehicles when the need arose. But although this is an example of a success, it also really illustrates the issues of a tankette. Most tanks it runs into will have a cannon, and most anti-tank guns it runs into will have a gun shield. So you either need to concentrate these vehicles and accept the losses, or, as I said, pair them with vehicles that have stronger armaments that can deal with these threats, just like the Germans did. Because of these issues, tankettes very quickly disappeared from the battlefield outside of being the odd infantry support vehicle along with heavier vehicles, or being used strictly behind the lines. It is only countries with weaker industrial bases that cannot retool factories or redesign weapons very quickly, such as Italy and Japan, where you see these vehicles being used into the mid to late war, with okay to bad results. But these examples shouldn't be taken as an illustration of the tankette's capability, but an illustration of the lack of industrial capability of the countries that stuck with them. A handful of what you could maybe describe as tankettes exist today, but they tend to fill more specific roles now, and mount additional weapon systems to give them more of a punch, such as guided anti-tank rockets, and see use in very limited numbers. Bus bike? You want it, huh? I'm fired, aren't I? Oh, you think? What can I say, Rick? Nothing you haven't said before. Tank destroyers are a fairly weird anomaly, as they are one of those things, like half-tracks, that were used widely by nearly every nation, performed their job well, but were pretty much completely scrapped after the war. Tank destroyers showed up as a sort of stopgap at a very particular point of tank design where nothing was universal yet. And the idea of what roles a tank was to be used in were still up in the air and varied greatly from army to army, with light, medium, and heavy tanks rolling around with various types of armor and armament that different countries had different approaches to handling. For a lot of countries, such as the Soviet Union and Germany, the tank destroyer was an easy and cost-efficient way to mount a large gun on an existing chassis. Just remove the turret, add a casemate, put in the biggest gun you can fit on it to kill enemy tanks, and you're off. No expensive and time-consuming chassis redesign, and the final product is much cheaper too because you don't have to tool all the parts for the moving turret. If you're the United States, on the other hand, and you don't need to worry about tooling because you got all those thick factories, you create an open-top turret to house a large gun that can be brought up when threats arise. Although the types, reasons for using, and implementation of tank destroyers vary from country to country, they're used the world over and gain much respect from the crews that use them and the soldiers that fought alongside them. My favorite tank, in fact, is in the form of a tank destroyer, the Ag Panther. Look at them curves and that aesthetic. But despite everything they had going for them, they pretty much disappear entirely after the Second World War, outside of surplus equipment that was used, and do not see many developments save a few. The reason for this is that after World War II, in the beginning of the main battle tank slash sort of still in the large heavy tank era, 
the firepower that was being put on a tank destroyer was fairly regularly already being put on a tank in a way that it was extremely effective and could deal with about all threats it encountered. So there was no reason to sacrifice the flexibility of having a turret for a bigger gun when at this point the slightly smaller or equally sized gun that you have can do the job the tank destroyer was going to do. On top of this, in peacetime there was no need to rush vehicles to the front, and the time and money you saved by creating tank destroyers wasn't really a factor anymore. For example, you could make a tank destroyer out of the Abrams chassis, housing a bigger gun, but the Abrams already has a very good gun with extremely effective modern ammunition, so it becomes a redundancy at the cost of losing the flexibility a turret provides. So although tank destroyers were very successful, they were moved away from and pushed into the dead end bin once better tanks had replaced their role for firepower. I'm sorry. You're a hero, and you have to leave. So just to restate what I said a few times in the various parts, outside of the large multi-turret designs, none of these tanks were universally unusable. They were just looking for the answer to the same question of how to use these new vehicle developments correctly, be it specialization, universal capabilities, or emphasis on firepower. But at the end of the day, they were not the right answer and were moved on from in pursuit of the perfect combination of the weapon, though some of them did have a role for the time. I'd like to thank all my patrons on Patreon for making all of this possible, including the ones you'll see on screen. I thought Meme Tanks 4 would be a good way to end such a great year, and I'm looking forward to creating more in the coming. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.